Hey guys, welcome to the show again. This is Hal, your host for another episode of the Vietnam Innovators podcast. Uh, we're super excited to welcome a new guest this morning. His name is Spencer Tan. He's the director for Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation uh, at Fulbright University of Vietnam, which is a pioneer in higher education in, in, in the country. Um, he's agreed to join us this morning and kind of share his insights and what they're up to here in Vietnam. Um, so we'll kind of move it on to Spencer here. Spencer, welcome to another episode here with us and, and our office this morning. Um, brief intro, who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, what's your role at Fulbright? Thank you. Well, thanks for having me this morning. Um, I, I've spent the last 14 years working in various avenues in education. I started off working at a, at a university uh, a long time ago at a similar center. Then I moved into working um, into in philanthropy and impact investing. And more recently, I worked at a, uh, a for-profit education company in, across Pan-Africa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was given the opportunity to... to, to come join this really unique endeavor in Vietnam. It was an opportunity that I just couldn't say no to. But my journey in Vietnam probably started like 14 years ago when I graduated from undergrad. Uh, I was planning on going to law school, but I graduated early, had this short like few months off. And uh, I applied for a Teach in Asia fellowship and I ended up in Hue in Vietnam. And it was one of the most like, transformative experiences I ever had. Uh, but in short, I, I was teaching like English to university students. And one of the biggest takeaways for me was that a lot of their ambitions of my students, um, I just felt could have been a lot more exciting. And, and, and really at the end of the day, I think it came to a difference in quality of education. And so I made a commitment to myself that one day I will return to Vietnam and work in education in an impactful way. So that was 14 years ago. Yeah. So why did it take so long for you to get here, you think? Good question. Good, good things, bad things from that experience. You know, yeah. I just, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't want to come back to be an English teacher. Basically, I wanted to come back when I feel like I had something substantive to offer mm -hmm. from understanding the complexities of systems change, from how difficult it is to transform education systems, and wanting to have enough experience and a platform to to, to have some meaningful change. And Fulbright is that really unique place to be for me. Yeah. So. Um, today, you know, aside from learning about your role at Fulbright and those initiatives that you're running, you know, we really also want to touch upon your experience as a Viet Q. Um, you know, there's a huge demand recently, especially after the COVID outbreak, where in the West, a lot of Vietnamese um, nationals and Vietnamese overseas who are, you know, undergoing like job loss or thinking about their career, you know, it's uh, it's kind of going back to the financial crisis in 2008. If you're graduating that year, like there's no jobs. Um, but fortunately here in Vietnam, we have a lot of growth and opportunity, which of course Fulbright's kind of tapping into. Um, so we'll definitely touch upon that subject as well. We'd love to hear from from you who's a bit more experienced and, you know, uh, kind of how do, you, how do you bided that time, 14 years, you know, um, you obviously bring a lot of experience back here as well. But anyways, um, jumping back into Fulbright. So um, Fulbright, why are they investing in entrepreneurship and innovation? Obviously, a university has a lot of different mandates. Um, entrepreneurship and innovation, very specific, and, and that's your kind of um, rapport. Uh, what's so special about this field that Fulbright's like, hey, we got to hire a director, we got to open a center for this? Like, why are they investing into this? Well, a couple of reasons. So, to, to give some background, you know, Fulbright University of Vietnam. Has, has a legacy in Vietnam for nearly 25 years. And that really started off with our, our School of Public Policy, mm -hmm. which really is our flagship initiative that really focuses on a lot of high-level um, government exchanges and policy teaching uh, that had a really robust track record. Um, but our newest endeavors, our undergraduate program, that really has only been around for the last two years. Mm. And what's distinctive about Fulbright is that we're the first not-for-profit institution in the country that also has full uh, academic autonomy. And we're also the first institution to pro provide need-based financial aid. Um, and we're also the first liberal arts institution. And the liberal arts education, for me in particular, is very valuable because you know the idea is that we want to create a new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders in Vietnam and in the region. And so a part of that naturally is how do we leverage this really dynamic part of the world, which is Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And everyone typically associates Vietnam with entrepreneurship and innovation. But you know, at its core, what does that really mean? Um, we need to also invest and have some depth in that area as well. And a lot of people and organizations and ideas get brought to Fulbright, but there hasn't been a natural place to really house those ideas or, or, or to test them or pilot them. And so the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, or what we call CEI, 
um, was established a couple of years ago, really to be this disruptive innovation lab to mm -hmm. f figure out ways that we can really test new ideas and concepts and figure out how Fulbright can really add value to the broader entrepreneurship mm -hmm. community. Uh, and so we do that through a few, uh, a few specific ways. Um, can, can I actually can yeah, I just yeah, go yeah. back and like talk about what our three key priorities are? Yeah, sure. And, and thanks for sharing a little about that background. What are those like top priorities? Would you say if you had to do a quick elevator pitch, one, two, three, what are those core objectives? Yeah, so our, our team and I, we just came back from a strategic retreat in Dalat and we came up with our, our next three year plan and we came up with three high level priorities. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in the power of three. So the first objective is that we really want to establish Fulbright University Vietnam as a trusted regional player in entrepreneurship and innovation. Mm -hmm. The second objective is that we want to create a new generation of ethical and entrepreneur leaders through skills-based learning. Mm -hmm. And the third objective, which is a bit broader, is how do we develop um, innovative education solutions that can really meet the workforce needs of Vietnam mm -hmm. or the needs of the workforce in Vietnam, rather. And so the first objective, how we establish ourselves as a trusted player, is through a lot of our content. Mm -hmm. um, and so next year in 2021, you'll see from us a lot of unique programs that extend not only to our students in the Fulbright community, but the broader community. So one is going to be convenings. Um, next year, we're planning on launching a women's uh, symposium. And the Women's Symposium is really focused around women entrepreneurship. We're really excited to see that Vietnam is actually kind of one of the leaders when it comes to having a lot of women mm. at the highest levels of, of, of commerce or entrepreneurship. But there are still a lot of gaps when it comes to gender equity. And we are planning on doing a day-long symposium in partnership with some other leading institu oh, institutions great. and players to really have a really unique dialogue. And um, when, when is that planned for? It's going to be likely be uh, the end of Q3. Okay. Yeah. Just as a side note too, we're actually invested quite heavily into that area and we're doing our own initiatives. So we'll definitely have to talk about that. Definitely. I think, I think what, what are some of the key results you see out of a symposium like that? Is it, is it more like um, you're hoping to draw more um, undergraduates at Fulbright to engage at that level? Are you hoping to engage more corporates and companies to see Fulbright as, as a leader and, and kind of partner in that segment? What are maybe some quantifiable results out of that? Yeah, and again, you will never convene just for the sake of convening, right? So in terms of this, it's A, it's how do we connect our students to opportunities and ideas and kind of and to understand what's out there from the, 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 the broader community is to actually convene really meaningful dialogues around what are some of the challenges uh, when, it, when we talk about gender equity, um, being able to forge really meaningful ideas and partnerships and cr create a platform so that they, they can actually take off. Because oftentimes at convenings, we bring people together, we talk about high level ideas and concepts, and then we go home. And we, it's a great networking event, but it's rare that we actually have a, a, a true, meaningful, unfiltered dialogue where we can actually help understand what are some of the key challenges and themes and also give them resources and a platform to figure out how they can make an impact, whether it's small or big. You know, we, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, but we're also realize that change takes time. But Fulbright wants to be that really unique place where people can come, share their ideas or offer their ideas and have a way to kind of dig deeper into them and find depth in them. And, and you mentioned that you guys want to kind of be a pipeline and conduit to connect these future young leaders to these either new or existing companies, especially in that scope of entrepreneurship and innovation. What are those key industries? Are they are they like in the techie kind of sense, like tech companies, um, banking you know companies? Are they just anything that requires a bit more digital transformation? What is that exactly? Who are those partners that you foresee? Sure, including. Uh, it's funny, like digital transformation. I've heard this word like 20 times in the last like, mm -hmm. few weeks. Yeah. It's the, the, the thing that everyone's talking about these days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's interesting. I think for, for us at our core, you know, we are a liberal arts institution. And the idea is that we want to be the place where students, our faculty, our community members can come and really focus on kind of a broader set of, of learning and realize that, you know, the, these fields are, in order to be successful in them, it's not that you don't need just a very specific technical skill. You actually need to have a lot of depth and understanding of mm. kind of the, whether it's the geopolitics of the region or you need to have it's you know, it's the soft skills, it's the critical thinking that we really embed in our students and making sure that they are, are when they leave our institution, that they 
they, they, they leave not only more informed, more effective leaders, um, but they, they leave here learning how to think on their own, not mm-hmm. necessarily, you know, they don't walk away with just very specific skills. Having said that, we, of course, want them to be employed and have really great jobs. And so, you know, we, we are going to be very market driven. We look at what the, the, what the needs of the market are and how to, and we think constantly, what are the types of program that we want to offer our students Mm -hmm. and our broader community? And so needless to say, you know, digital transformation, whether it's coding technology, other parts of technology, like AI, um, you know, robotics, Mm -hmm. you know, these are all things that we naturally will have layers of depth in our programming. But because we are a new institution, we've only been around for two years, our undergraduate program, it's going to take us some time to get there. In the short term, we focus on building a really good arsenal of skills for our students and then connecting them to industry. Um, you know, I th- we think that the, 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 the kind of the top three trends uh, that, that a lot of our students will, will likely end up in, or, or three major industries that will have the biggest demand, rather, will be likely in you know logistics, supply chain, last mile delivery related mm-hmm. content or I- industries. Second will definitively be, you know, en- computer science, technology, um, you know, AI. The third one will likely be workforce development and mm-hmm. skills development. If you think about it with the, across ASEAN and around the region, you have this fast growing dynamic region. You have a lot of you know, multinational companies and players that want to make big bets and investments in the region. But ultimately, a big choke point will be, you know, talent. Mm -hmm. And we see ourselves as being a a really meaningful player in that talent development. Mm -hmm. And so specifically, it's, you know, across the board, it's usually it's around soft skills. Um, It's but soft skills has a broad definition. Soft skills could be like, you know, how to deliver effective presentation or how like time management. Mm. But I think the soft skills that we're talking about or we'd like to really be engaged in are a bit more rigorous. It's like, first and foremost, how do you identify a problem? I mean, you have a problem. Can you come up with a solution? But, you know, coming up with a solution is not the hardest part. It's figuring out how to execute mm. on that solution is usually a difficult piece, right? So it's, it's the critical thinking, effective communication, um, the critical thinking, uh, you know, and you, we do this through our, our teaching pedagogy, which is really around, surrounded around applied learning. And, and, and so if we're able to, to, to really scale this type of teaching, um, or not only within Vietnam and regionally, we think we can play a really effective role when it comes to workforce development. Workforce development. I, I love that. I think, um, and you mentioned Fulbright's, uh, its undergraduate program has only been two years in existence and obviously three or four years before a student has a degree. Um, let's fast forward and look to the future a little bit. In, in five to 10 years, what are some of the graduates of Fulbright University doing in Vietnam that define this workforce development? Are they um, are they CEOs of companies, you know, what you would hope, um, are they starting new initiatives? Maybe you can even ha- cherry pick a couple, no, you don't need to drop names, but maybe those, uh, kind of personalities you see at Fulbright that have that potential, like uh, what is that audience persona you, you see in, in a few years time? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think about this a lot actually. Um, you know, as I, as I said, the, the, the end game is that I want to be a part of an enterprise or an institution that's creating a new generation of you know, ethical entrepreneur leaders for the country and for the region. And that comes in all different shapes, sizes, and forms, right? Some of our students will, will in fact, start companies. Some of them will fail, and some of them will hopefully have the next unicorns, mm-hmm. um, whether they're tech startups. Some of them will become creative geniuses that will you know, become film directors or they'll become leading artists or musicians. Some of our students will become, you know, will, will rise in the ranks of your traditional uh, you know, corporate role in the finance sector, whether they're in banking or consulting, what have you. Some of them might even aspire to get involved in public service mm-hmm. and ultimately maybe even uh, getting more involved in government down the line. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Do you, do you see most of them staying in Vietnam? You think for their, is that the goal of Fulbright too? Where we, you know, people talk about this like uh, brain drain where a lot of Vietnamese are obsessed with sending their, their, their families and their children abroad to study, you know, just before the session I was researching online where something like in the billions of dollars, I don't have the exact number, so I can't say it right now, but, um, the, the number of students that are going abroad, you know, continues to increase every year. But at the same time, a lot of these, uh, students are coming back to Vietnam right now, rather than staying abroad for those students at Fulbright. Um, I'm guessing you, you, that's part of the mission of Fulbright too, not to only encourage education here in Vietnam, but also to, um, 
stem the brain drain in a way. Is that is that one of the missions of Fulbright that you see kind of, you know, all problems that you've seen in the market and Fulbright's kind of maybe not intentionally trying to solve, but, you know, hopes to be a part of? Yeah, I think it's a bit more implicit than explicit. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, well, for instance, this year, you know, COVID-19 has been a, presented us a number of challenges, but it also kind of forced us to activate a number of opportunities. A lot of Vietnamese students could not return to the, the, whatever country they were studying in after the the, 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 the the Tet holiday. And so what they did was they actually just enrolled in Fulbright. Mm. And a lot of those students found the, the beauty and the value of this really unique, interesting place in Vietnam where they're studying 100% in English. Um, they are being engaged in a classroom which, in which they've never really f experienced in, if they went to a local university or school in Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, where they were working in small groups where they never just sat in lectures. They always had this really unique discussion community, learning community, like the true liberal arts education. Another, th another aspect is that a lot of our students, frankly, they, a lot of them go to um, these magnet high schools and they, they score really well on SATs. And they have a lot of options to study overseas, mm -hmm. but when they get exposed to the Fulbright ecosystem, they immediately realize, wow, there's a really unique opportunity for me to A, stay closer to home, mm -hmm. but B, also get a really unique world-class education without having to make a sacrifice of going overseas. Because going overseas, it, you know, comes with its own set of opportunity costs as well. You're, mm -hmm. you're away from family. There typically is some a greater financial burden. Um, and the reality is there's a reason why everybody wants to return to Vietnam now. This mm -hmm. is one of the fastest, you know, growing emerging markets in the world. And people see that. So for a highly skilled Vietnamese student, uh, there's a lot of natural, unique opportunity mm -hmm. for them to stay in Vietnam and be a leader here. And I think people and especially young people see that opportunity. Yeah, you mentioned um, you know, the opportunity costs, you know, a lot of them who end up coming back home anyways. Uh, acclimating to the business environment or even social environment after being four or five, six years away is not the most easy. It's not the easiest thing to do, especially in a country that's growing so fast. You mentioned on Fulbright, um, and I, I saw this as a, as a peculiar kind of note as a Fulbright's curriculum. It's 100% in English. And you guys are trying to obviously build future leaders in Vietnam. Um, do you see there being a problem where if they're not learning in Vietnamese actively that they might have um, the same problem of acclimatization, if I'm pronouncing that right, in a Vietnamese business environment? And, and if so, are you guys have, have any programming or involvement at a professional level for these students to, to better uh, kind of position for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is that, you know, we don't, we always, we always challenge ourselves to make sure that our students don't live in the, what we call the Fulbright bubble. Mm. Um, but the, the real reality is that, you know, the, the, the amount of time they're spending in a classroom speaking in English is maybe 20% of their time or 30% mm. or a third of their time at max. The rest of the time they're working in group projects and in, in, in small discussions. And typically, you know, they're going to day to day, gonna, day, -to -day they're communicating Vietnamese. Vietnamese. And yeah. a lot of our faculty are Vietnamese as well. And so mm. when it comes to, when there are topics that they don't understand, because for instance, a lot of students that take eco economics, um, you know, some of the content is, is, is quite advanced and technical. And so they naturally will default to Vietnamese. And so we have that balance, but by no means is the fact that, the, you know, our primary mode of instruction in English, uh, I think it serves as a disconnect to, 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 to the pulse of what's going on in Vietnam, because mm -hmm. if anything, I think they're still rel relatively well connected. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that also so all, the students all take um, Vietnamese studies courses. Mm -hmm. And so the exciting part about that is connecting them to a lot of the depth um, and the richness of Vietnamese culture, even outside the scope of what they may know. Because a lot of Vietnamese students growing up, um, or even for me, like growing up, yeah, sure, I learn about American history, but I find myself way more plugged into or excited about learning about, you know, other, other, you know, other periods of history or, or understanding about different other, other different cultures and languages, mm -hmm. um, just because it's a bit more unique. And so the idea that we actually invest in students understanding different perspectives uh, and have levels of depth in Vietnamese culture and language is something that we're really excited about. And, you know, even things like the, the Vietnam War, it's because of our academic freedom, we're able to, you know, for instance, one of the things that the students do is they, 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 they listen to the Vietnamese narrative and then they also watch, um, you know, Ken Burns' documentary on Netflix on the Vietnam War from a very Western perspective. And the idea is not that they need to pick one perspective over the other, it's that, you know, in our liberal arts education, they're understanding multiple perspectives. 
and coming up with their own conclusion. Mm. Got it. I, I, you know, this idea of like critical thinking and, and um, constructing arguments and, and understanding both sides kind of thing. Do, do you find that students, um, you know, usually they, they realize the value of that once they're in the education. But let's talk about like the application or interest in Fulbright. Um, how are you guys kind of drumming up kind of interest in the university at a holistic scale? Because these ideas that you talk about, they're not necessarily um, spoken about at a, at a large scale or entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, um, a lot of families might be scared by that because, hey, you know, you should get a, go get a job that's, you know, well paying and, and stick to that. Why? But it's not, even, you know, maybe you can elaborate on that. Are those do they really care about those things or is it more of an institutional thing that you guys care about? That's a good, good question. It's something we think to be seen, to be decided. I mean, you know, we're new, so it is kind of TBD, Mm. but ultimately our admissions team, I think is one of the best in class. And I've seen admissions at a number of different universities and at Fulbright, it's a very customized approach. We literally send Fulbright reps to like the nooks and crannies of this country. Mm. Um, And the, Primary reason is because we want to make sure that our incoming class represents a level of diversity that's reflective of the country, which is why our admissions team will go to random small communities to mm-hmm. identify ethnic minorities with a lot of you know, talent or people with severe di- learning disabilities, whether they're blind or they're, they're handicapped, and feel, make them feel welcomed at the, in the Fulbright community. Mm-hmm. So that, that's one thing. But the reality is that you know, we have a big wait list to get into Fulbright. This mm-hmm. year, we only have um, 300 spots, and we'll likely have 1,500 plus qualified applications. Mm-hmm. And qualified is meaning they completed everything, and they've submitted the, the, the application fee mm-hmm. um, the, the, the I think the, the people are, are understanding the value of a American style liberal arts education although we are very proud that we are uniquely a Vietnamese institution we, oftentimes people assume that we're an American mm-hmm. institution but we're not we're very much a Vietnamese institution that just happens to teach with a, a, a Western liberal arts approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think a lot of families are seeing the value of sending them to a place like Fulbright because they've seen kind of the byproduct of a lot of the where students may, may you know, the, 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 the journeys or the paths of a lot of graduates from a lot of other institutions in the country. And so for some people like hmm, I'm kind of taking a bet. But I like what I see, and this mm-hmm. could lead to something really exciting. And the uh, and some other families just really see this as the place where they want their kids to be enriched and learn and grow. Um, but you're right; it is interesting. A liberal arts education versus saying you're going to learn, you know, early on you're going to be predisposed to medicine or engineering. It is kind of against the trodden path for mm-hmm. a lot of Vietnamese families. Um, but I think you know it's 2020 now. People are realizing that you need to have different depth and diversity. And you also want to align yourself with an institution that has a really good track record. And while Fulbright's undergraduate program is new, um, I think our, what, the progress that we've made through our 25-year track record in our public policy school um, and kind of our promise is what a lot of people are betting on. Mm-hmm. So I think it is TBD. Do you see a lot of the inter- interest coming from the students themselves or the families? You mentioned 1,500 qualified applications. Do you see kind of in the background, is it like one of their parents like forcing a student to kind of apply? Is it mostly uh, the interest from the student itself? I mean, I remember when I was applying for university some 10 years ago, a lot of my interest was obsessed with the most prestigious school, not necessarily even the curriculum. So maybe you can kind of touch upon that. Like, uh, you know, where is that interest coming from? And you mentioned about the diversity as well. Let's break it down, like not just geographically, but even socioeconomically. What does that look like? Uh, well, in terms of socio socioeconomic, you know, we are the first university in the country to have need based financial aid. And so your ability to pay will never be a factor of admission. In fact, it's our application is, is, is completely need blind. So we actually have no idea you know, what your financial capacity is. We may have a general idea based mm-hmm. on where you of come course, from, yeah. but th- that that will never lead to an immediate admission um, mm-hmm. outcome. And our admissions team take they, they read every single application is reviewed multiple times in addition to 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 either face to face or virtual interviews. So we're really looking for a very holistic student body. And in terms of numbers, we, we, we are very proud that, you know, we, we, we have more than over 50% of our body, student body are, are women. Um, so we lead in terms of women. Um, in terms Is that of, an anomaly in Vietnam? Do most universities have men? Yeah, I, I, I think it... it uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know, mm-hmm. um, but it is something that is unique that we, we typically do have, you know, the fact that nearly 60% of our 
our class as mm-hmm. women does mm-hmm. say something mm-hmm. about the way in which we really value this gender diversity. But maybe that also says something about who's typically more geared toward a liberal arts education. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to say. Sure. I don't, don't want to make it up, but it is something that we are we're excited to see in terms of having that level of richness and diversity. Um, in terms of geographic spread, we, we needless to say have a, a natural large group that come from the major cities, Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. Um, but like I said, our, our admission team scours the country and we go to all sorts of different um, communities so that we have a really unique representation of Vietnam. Some of our students don't even speak Vietnamese because they come from ethnic minority groups. Mm. And therefore, English is even something that is a bit of a challenge. But a lot of our students, uh, when they enter Fulbright, if, um, you know, if they don't meet the minimum standard for, for English, then they have to go through an intensive summer boot camp mm. focused on a lot of skills development and English um, training so that when they enter their their freshman year, they'll be ready for the classes. Excellent. Well, it looks like innovation is, is touching upon all aspects of the Fulbright education, even before it starts. Um, those are some questions for me, but we actually received quite a number of uh, listener questions. So for those of you that don't know, I, I post on my LinkedIn and Facebook a few days before each podcast. And uh, we, we sometimes get hundreds of questions. Uh, for Spencer, um, we received quite a number about um, education as, as a whole. Um, so we're going to kind of listen to a couple here. Uh, we have, I think, two or three questions. So we're going to play one for you right now. Um, let's go for it. Yep. Hi, Hao. Hi, Spencer. I'm Jason, and I have a question for you. Um, one thing that I would like to learn more about in Vietnam is what the future of environmental policies nationwide will look like and uh, how those guy massive scale development projects, for example, new airport or increased import cargo in the south, uh, because from what I see, uh, renewable energy, decarbonization, and sustainable development could be a major revenue generator, and also plus um, a huge creator of good paying jobs for Vietnamese students in years and decades to come while boosting the value of STEM education and Vietnam's global competitiveness. Uh, thank you. So I think the question here from Jason was, you know, there's a lot of logistics you touched upon and and infrastructure projects happening in Vietnam, especially in green energy. Um, do you guys do a lot of work in that area? Do you have students interested in that? And and he mentioned high paying jobs. That was another thing. Like, I'd love to hear what Fulbright's kind of vision for that industry is. I think, again, what, at, at our core, we are we're a liberal arts institution. And so the idea is really giving students a foundation for learning. When it comes to these more technical disciplines, we realize this is one of the big growing opportunities in Vietnam. And so, so you know, we have our, our School of Engineering and Computer Science that's kind of in its infancy. And over time, over the next few years, you'll see us, especially by the time we move to our District 9 campus, we will have a really robust um, engineering, civil engineering, computer science program. And the idea is that we are creating the the, the, the cutting edge technical talent of the country that will be working on these major infrastructure issues and, 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 and opportunities. But I think the, when it comes to like say climate change or these infrastructural uh, opportunities that, that are rising in Vietnam. At the end of the day, if you ask yourself, what do, you, what do we really need when it comes to talent? Sure, we need engineers that can actually build true solutions, whether it's a bridge or a dam or renewable energy solutions. But if you really want to solve the complexities of these problems that affect all of us in this room or, or our, our day-to-day life, what we're really talking about is, is changing a more planning, planning and yeah, like and a broader level of, the, planning, of the issue, yeah. right? Like, yeah, it's like urban planning. It's good governance. It's 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 it's, it's, it's uh, you know, and make, making sure that we have. Uh, Balancing the economic, uh, balance environmental le- and business landscape to do these things, and so none of us are hardwired just to do one specific discipline. Mm. But the idea is that if you have more leaders who are entering the workforce, working on these these really big, meaty challenges, then I think the better we all are. Cool. Well, Spencer, we've got another question, so we're going to play that now too. Hi, Spencer. Uh, my name is Anthony, and I have a question for you. Uh, Do we see a future where students prefer to study online rather than going to a physical school or university? As more and more businesses are moving uh, virtual, do you think if there are any major gaps between the current educational system and the real world? 
Thank you. So, you know, this question is obviously applied at a global scale, but in Vietnam, where we only had a lockdown for a month, you know, the behavior of studying virtually it was not as common practice, I guess you could say, as or extended. Uh, but what did Fulbright do during the situation? And, and uh, is it something you guys will continue? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, you know, I'm a member of our digital transformation task force at, at, at Fulbright. And so COVID presented us with a really unique challenge and opportunity like everybody else. But, you know, we had, after the Tet holiday, essentially, we had to figure out in a very short amount of time, how do we transform all of our classes into you know, online courses. And not only did that take a lot of training with our faculty, but it was preparing our students. And, you know, our first pilot was basically primarily Zoom and Google Hangouts and lots of meticulous uh, back and forth communication by email. Uh, but there came with challenges. Like I said, some of our students come from very rural communities where they don't have fast 3G or, or let alone 4G. So, you know, they're not able to turn on their camera or they're not able to log on and, and engage the same way as they would on our, on our campus. But I think I'm, we're very proud of, our, of our, our response at Fulbright because in a very short amount of time, we were basically able to take our entire course catalog for that semester uh, digital. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the broader question here is kind of our position on virtual. I, I'm a firm believer, and I think our stance at Fulbright on this is that quality learning can never be replaced by virtual learning. Virtual learning will only be a very valuable supplement. Um, inevitably, you know, needless to say, rather, you, you can really learn anything online. I mean, the other day, I, you know, I forgot some, like, a basic, like, calculus equation. I logged on to Khan Academy, <laughs> like, or, or like, you know, basic algebra. Was like, it's a, more functional it's, learning, yeah, potentially, functional, not collaborative or group learning. or Exactly. Or, um, strategic or conceptual stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if we, if our, if our north star is that we want to create this new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders, you can't learn that through watching videos. You have to learn that through our applied learning approach. You have to be in small groups, peer-to-peer -peer learning, working on hands-on on on, on 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 problems. But you know, part of the the Fulbright mandate actually is how do we think about in you know taking Fulbright's culture, our, our pedagogy, and our training philosophy nationwide. At scale, when we launch our District 9 campus, Fulbright's undergraduate population will cap out around 1,500 plus, more or less. But we're in a country nearly of 100 million people, so how do we actually think about changing some of these bigger ticket uh, you know, system level uh, problems? And so at the CEI, as I mentioned, one of our third strategic priorities is to develop innovative education solutions to meet the needs of the workforce. And so in 2021, the CEI team is piloting kind of like our own startup within a startup. We're essentially building our own ed tech company out of Fulbright to figure out how we can uh, take an aspect of our uh, Fulbright training philosophy and take it nationwide at, to a level of scale that we can test. And so, for instance, in next by the end of Q2, we hope to have launched as close to an MVP as possible, where we're going to start off with uh, uh, coding, but we don't want to just do coding in itself. We want to focus on product management and product development. And so we also want to blend a lot of these soft skills training that we're talking about. So we are launching a program in Ho Chi Minh City where all of the instruction will be uh, recorded uh, live here. And then we'll be the students and we're, we're, we're thinking about opening three sites, Ho Chi Minh City and Da Nang, Hanoi. In Da Nang and Hanoi, our students will obviously be learning a lot of the, the, the hard skill content virtually through interactive online lectures, but they'll still get the Fulbright unique experience because in these cities, whether in the central or North Vietnam, they'll still be sitting in a classroom or co-working space, working with a teacher and a facilitator where they're still working hands-on on projects, where they're, le they're learning about problem solving, they're learning you know, the technical foundation of coding, but also learning how that applies from a product development perspective. It's really easy to say, hey, can you change this icon in the app from blue to orange? It's a different um, and more sophisticated uh, level of rigor needed to understand what the user experience behind it is. Why does the customer, the end user, need this color change versus just being told to do that? And so the idea is that we want to figure out ways that we can launch market-driven content at scale, but do it in a way in which it's also low cost. Because if we, you know, if we outprice the market, then obviously we have very little. We'll have very little demand. Mm -hmm. So our north star really is workforce development and doing it in a way with quality and and scalability. Very good. Um, we've got one final listener question for you today, Spencer. We're going to give it a go here. Hi, my name is Tao, and I have a question for Spencer. What are some of the biggest opportunities and challenges for entrepreneurship and innovation education in Vietnam? 
what and how are innovation topics currently delivered at Fulbright University? So again, here, I, I think uh, the delivery, you mentioned content and all these, you know, nice sounding objectives. Uh, how is that being delivered functionally for you guys at the moment? I mean, at the end of the day, entrepreneurship at its core is, you know, identifying a problem and, and, and solving it, right? So we constantly want to provide the opportunity for our students to figure out on their own, identify problems in the marketplace, like true problems, understand how to, like, not only and identifying a problem is, seems quite easy, but identifying a true gap in the marketplace requires a lot more rigor and research and understanding and depth and giving our students the opportunity to continue to go out there and scout real uh, challenges and opportunities that they face in their day-to-day -day life in their community and then coming up with solutions it may seem quite simple but it's actually a bit more it's a bit more complex when it comes to an application um, innovation is also innovation is at the end of the day it's a new way of thinking right and so we're constantly you know whether it's it's, it's bringing a number of in, innovative and uh, unique startup entrepreneurs or speakers, artists, you know, we bring a lot of people to the Fulbright community. We've been really, um, you know, privileged that we've been able to get some of the bestest and brightest, not only in Vietnam, but regionally and in the world to come join us at Fulbright. But, but at the end of the day, it's, it, it, what's innovative and distinctive about Fulbright is that we're constantly sparking this fire in our students for them to go out and figure out what are the new exciting opportunities and avenues for them to make an impact. Because it, without that self-discovery, then you just have a whole generation of people who are listening. And we want a, a new generation of people who are leading. But sure, I mean, you think about all the, the, new, the, all the new cutting edge technologies, all the new uh, uh, you know, sophisticated way of, of doing things and learning. We try to embed those into our community. But at the end of the day, those are just, uh, what's the right word? Those are just um, like ancillary aspects of what a true solid liberal arts education will be. And so our focus will always be around the teaching and giving the students this kind of like broader aperture to look at the world and going to self explore and hopefully do something really amazing out of it. Excellent. Well, Spencer, thank you for joining us on another episode of Vietnam Innovators this morning. Uh, again, thank you. Um, tons of insights this morning about education, higher education, innovation. Hopefully you guys have learned something here today. Um, that's it for us. I'm your host, Tao Tran. Uh, thanks for tuning in and look out next Tuesday for the next episode. Thanks so much, Spencer. Thank you. You can find the full audio of this episode of Vietnam Innovators on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in every Tuesday morning to listen to other innovating stories of our guest speakers. Thanks for listening to another episode of Vietnam Innovators, brought to you by our partners, health tech startup GeoHealth. They're best known for their doctor at home services, but offer much more than that. If you haven't already, check out their mobile apps on the App Store and Google Play for more, or drop by for a visit to their new smart clinic at M Plaza in Ho Chi Minh City.